really cool to be here and meet some new people. I'm, um, let's see if I can get this up right. Uh, Josiah, can you see that? Everything looking good on your end? I can see it. It's not full screen yet. There it goes. All right. Looks like we got it dialed in. Every platform's different. All right. So, uh, I'm happy to be here. I, I have, uh, you know, what I'm going to be presenting on, uh, progressive farming is a kind of a broad categorization of you know, regenerative farming uh, beyond organic farming, let's call it. Uh, one of the things that we'll talk about uh, over time is kind of how organic has become better. You know, you could, you could argue it's better uh, than conventional, uh, but it still leaves a bit to be desired in regards to how natural living systems work. So my work is based around, I work as a consultant. Uh, I also manufacture and distribute a, a, a product line of compost tea brewers and uh, ingredients. Um, and we have fertility management services that do soil testing and water testing and survey-based recommendations. Um, so wanted to give you a little bit of background on me so you can understand where I'm coming from, kind of how I ended up in this chair talking to you guys through the internet about uh, farming. Uh, and just tell a little story there. I think it'll, it'll make some sense in regards to kind of you know, the passion that I have for this and, you know, where I'm hoping to take it. Um, so I hope you get some out of that. Uh, and I've developed a platform called Bioenergetic Agriculture that um, I, I use as a platform of understanding and dialogue and action towards regenerating tired soil and uh, making the most out of just about any agronomic activity. Um, so with that being said, uh, let's get into it. Uh, you know, my name is Evan. I uh, come from, uh, I live in North Wilmington, North Carolina. I was born in Greensboro, North Carolina. I uh, was not raised in a farming family. I always had an interest in the natural world, um, but, you know, never really uh, didn't live on a farm. Had some cows in my backyard one time. Um, went to uh, University of North Carolina at Wilmington to be a marine biologist and was quickly uh, come, came to terms with the fact that, you know, if I didn't know exactly what I needed to, I wanted to do, uh, that I have to go to a whole lot of school to do it. So just got a general biology degree, uh, religion degree. I was a bit of a seeker. Um, and when I came out of school, I, you know, suffice it to say, I didn't even know what I wanted to know. Uh, I think that's the case for a lot of people these days in terms of the way that we train ourselves to think analytically. So a lot of where I come from is kind of uh, starting on the other side of the fence. And what started it for me was this book called Secrets of the Soil. I, uh, I moved to the Virgin Islands when I got done with college and was a bit disillusioned. And uh, best, one of the best things I ever did, it, it taught me a lot of things. I, I didn't know anybody when I moved there. And you know, told my, taught myself that no matter where I went, I could get things figured out. I was making more money than I could spend down there in paradise. Uh, so I lived there for about a year. Uh, but probably the most important thing that happened to me was finding this book. And uh, if you've never heard of this book, I'd highly recommend you seeking it out. Uh, it's had a, it had a tremendous influence on me. Uh, I started a garden store uh, shortly after finding this book and, and kind of made it my mission to, to build a bridge for as many people as possible uh, to have these types of in, uh, understandings. And, you know, it, it, there's a whole chapter on the efficacy of a vortex in the water. Uh, it talks about the soil food web, about biodynamic agriculture, um, about, uh, you know, all sorts of things that, you know, maybe referenced in school, but, you know, a lot of uh, a living system can't be measured with anything other than a snapshot. And what we tend to do is kind of work with those snapshots. You know, what's replicable becomes science. Um, but it's fair to say that nature doesn't work in replication. You know, nature works in chaos and spirals. And by design, the same thing doesn't happen every time. So it doesn't fit nice and neat into the scientific method that we've adopted to, to find truth in science, if you will. Um, so that was my training in school. And then I get out of school and I find this book and, Basically, what it's telling me is there's more life than what is physically here. Now, some of you, that may uh, smack as obvious. Uh, others, maybe you haven't considered it before. I, I, you know, most people that I come across in, in my life uh, believe this in, in one way, shape, or form or have experienced it. Um, 
you know, we could go start a war on who's right and wrong there, and I'm, I'm not going there. Um, but it's, it's a very important concept. Um, and one of the things I hope to get across today is just the idea that we're really not allowing our imagination to run wild in this arena of, of life force. And um, it's, it's arguably the, the missing link between the type of agriculture we want and the type of agriculture that we have. Uh, so, you know, I moved back from the Virgin Islands. I started a garden center called Progressive Gardens. I did that for almost 15 years, closed that down about six, eight months ago. Um, basically with the under, you know, retail has gotten changed a lot in the last uh, more than a decade, amazon.com. And, um, you know, I always had more than one company. So my focus had waned on the retail. My ambition wasn't to go open more retail stores. I, you know, kind of in the later years really came to terms with the fact that I was operating as a consultant. And so it, it, it really came to a point where I needed to formalize that activity outside of a retail type space where I was talking to backyard gardeners and I'd sit there for two hours and try to help somebody understand the soil food web. And, uh, you know, they may buy a $10 bag of fertilizer. And um, so I, I kind of changed the tact of what I was doing, it was kind of my boot camp. Uh, I dealt with almost every issue from backyard gardens to acreage farms. I uh, developed a wealth of experience on hydroponic gardening, which we'll talk about uh, at, at some point over time. Um, and indoor controlled environment agriculture, wheatgrass, uh, commercial wheatgrass and microgreens that we did out of the company. Uh, I ran a lawn care company out of the retail store for three seasons um, and developed a soil testing process uh, that we have formalized in those fertility management services that take a base saturation approach to soil testing as opposed to a lot of the pH driven macronutrient type focus that you find in, in traditional soil testing. Um, and developed uh, the compost tea business uh, all the while. So uh, this lawn care company was another kind of mini boot camp for me. It allows me to speak with, uh, you know, lawn care professionals in a way that I wouldn't have if I hadn't have done that work. Um, so it, it also gave me the opportunity to work intensively with, um, you know, hundreds of different landscapes um, and was uh, a successful endeavor. I, I, I think it's fair to say I did it long enough to know that I didn't want to run a lawn care company forever. Um, but it was a great experience for me. Um, I, I ran a seven acre market farm for three seasons. Uh, we had a community supported agriculture program. Um, and we were, our mandate was to develop a, a farm property for a real estate endeavor they're developing about 750 homes right outside of, of wilmington here and they like the agri hood approach and wanted to integrate um, food food production into the markets that they had and for the residents so that was a very good learning experience in regards to organic certifications dealing with the general public uh, trying to start a farm for a real estate company who's you know not necessarily looking to build a balance sheet they're trying to flip everything so um, you know, learned a whole lot about um, how those things work. Again, it gives me an, an ability to talk to farmers in this way as well. Um, and more recently have developed uh, programs that uh, seek to turn residential landscapes into farms. You know, there's a big movement in urban, urban agriculture. One of the things that I've found um, in, a, in a lot of new agricultural scenarios is that the assumption is you can just rip the grass up or, you know, till the ground up and plant the the plants and everything will work the way that you want it to. And if the soil is not right, it won't. Um, and it's a tremendous frustration. And there's nothing uh, as, as difficult as putting all of that energy into to, uh, performing your agronomy and, and not being able to see the quality of the soil, making those assumptions and then not having things work out the way that you like. Um, so, um, you know, we'll probably speak about this in some detail as well. Um, you, can, you can find the farm yard movement at farm-a-yard.com if you wanted some more information on that. Um, and I'm currently the founder and president of Progressive Farms. Uh, as I mentioned, it's, it's primarily a consulting company and we develop a product line around uh, what we call bioenergetic agriculture in order to help people implement uh, the perspective that we're trying to articulate in regards to working with living systems. Um, so in, a, in many ways, with all the experiences that I've had, this is a culmination of my life's work. And, um, you know, I, again, really appreciate the opportunity to communicate it to everybody out there. Uh, my family uh, wouldn't be able to do it without them. 
Look at that, I'm wearing the same shirt in this picture that I am now. I do change clothes. Um, <laughs> my son Dylan there is five. Uh, my daughter Blythe is 10, and my wife Mary Margaret. Uh, we've been married for uh, nine years and uh, love them dearly. So uh, enough about me. I want to get into a little bit of the meat of, of some of the things that we'll be learning over time. Today is not really a detail-oriented discussion. It's more of an uh, introduction, ability for me to say hello, um, give you a little information about me, and then kind of paint a broad stroke on bioenergetics so that you can see that for um, kind of what I've come to in terms of that insight. Um, so we'll get into the, the platform of bioenergetics in a second, but um, you know, I don't think it's ironic that uh, the root of the word humus is humble. Uh, I, th I believe that the, you know, the more that uh, comfortable we are with not knowing, the more we know. Um, there's an element of faith in, in nature that uh, has been lost in conventional and even organic uh, uh, applications. Humus is the end result of, of biological uh, microbial de decomposition. It's the lowest state of organic matter. It's perfect plant food, uh, let's call it. Um, so this idea of, you know, the further we look, the more there is to discover is very real. Um, and I, I, I think on one hand, we have too many experts, you know, people that have figured things out, put it in a box and called it what it is. Um, and on the other hand, not enough. You know, I think part of, uh, of my experience is, you know, listening to the experts can get you so far, right? It's like, uh, you know, if we only know what we're taught, we know very little sort of thing. Uh, so what what we try to do is kind of break down the barrier between people that know and people that don't inspire everyone to understand that they can they can get the a grip on soil testing and compost tea and soil agronomy and these types of things uh, and really empower people to have an experience. Uh, I think that's what's missing in a lot of this is we you know most of us don't grow up farming. Uh, if we do, then it's somewhat second nature. Um, it's really difficult to project the value of that second nature to someone else. It's kind of like if you eat a bad diet and you start eating better and it makes you feel better. Well, man, I feel fantastic. Well, somebody else can appreciate what you're saying, but they can't feel it, right? They haven't had that same experience. It doesn't have the same meaning for them. So I, I think there's really no replacement for experience. Um, and that's a lot of what we'll, we'll be talking about is ways to kind of apply uh, the mindset that we're learning and put, put our will and our perspective into action. Um, I think there's a limitation of language. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. I'm a fan of making up words, uh, you know, I coined the term egolution, this, this idea that, um, you know, there's, there's human consciousness involves self-reflection and choice that's unique in the animal world. Um, the idea that humans just evolve creates this environment of kind of inevitability that we just do what we do. And it kind of mitigates the responsibility that we should have in regards to leveraging uh, living systems. And let's face it, agriculture in, in general is manipulation of the natural environment. Um, so I, I, I find that creating concepts around these kinds of things allows us to, to look at them and, and give them a name and, and um, work with them more proactively. And the term deproductive is, is kind of a, a, an observation that, you know, on many different levels in modern society, we do things consciously that undermine what we would want if we were asked. Um, it could be as simple as driving a car. It's not a judgment kind of thing. Um, you know, we all drive a car, uh, for most of us, I would assume, and it's a finite resource. It pollutes. We buy it from people that may not have our interest in mind, um, yet it gets us to where we go, uh, and we need that. Um, but being able to look at that critically and, and give it a name and understand that it's not necessarily the most productive thing to have an, an energy system built on these types of principles is helpful, and you can apply the same thing to agriculture. It's not a judgment if you need to apply an herbicide uh, or a pesticide or a fungicide, um, but the question becomes, is that toxic rescue chemistry? Is that, is that you know, the root of that, is that an imbalance in the system? Uh, or is it just nece is it, is it necessary based on an outlier? Um, so again, you know, th this concept of, of, of language and starting, uh, you gotta start somewhere, uh, is really important to me. Um, so, uh, you know, I developed a, a way of talking about um, these things, personal agriculture, right? Um, we all are a part of agriculture, whether we realize it or not, uh, whether we wanna be or not. You know, great Wendell Berry said, eating is an agricultural act. 
Um, so, you know, whether we realize it or not, we vote for what we have available in our food system with every bite that we take. Uh, there's a lot of people looking to grow their own food these days and their own medicine. Um, and that's born of the fact that the, you know, if our food system doesn't support uh, people from a nourishment perspective, it's become a, a, a business. And, you know, I, I don't look at business as evil. Uh, it's like blaming the murderer on the gun, uh, right? So, you know, it's, it's how we apply these things and our awareness towards it and our ability to articulate and use our buying power to encourage what we want is really, really important. Um, very literally, you know, what we think we grow uh, and what we eat, we know. Um, uh, one of the things that Secrets of the Soil introduced me to was a man named Rudolf Steiner. Uh, if you've never uh, seen Steiner's work, he gave over 6,000 lectures in his lifetime. He lived back in the 1920s. He died in 1925, I believe. Uh, and he delivered what's called the agriculture course now in 1924. And it was, it was actually the first reaction to chemical farming, even before organic was a, a concept. Uh, and he was asked by farmers that were having issues having adopted conventional agricultural practices uh, that were having issues with their animals that they'd never seen before, uh, foot and mouth disease and different things. And they noticed that something was wrong um, as they started to bring in a lot of the, the fertilizers and the, and the biocides that were frankly developed in, in the world wars. Um, but they didn't know what to do about it necessarily. And they asked Dr. Steiner if he could deliver lectures that would help them regenerate the life force of their farms. It's kind of the way it's, it's put. And what he brought forward was really profound. It was, you know, beyond organic bef before organic, if you will. Um, and it's, you know, every time that I read the agriculture course, I get something else out of it. A, a paragraph is like a chapter. It's it, the depth of spiritual science involved in his um, methods is unparalleled. Uh, and it has to do with celestial rhythms and all sorts of things that we have remnants of, like in the farmer's almanac and sowing by the moon, for example. Um, well, he would bring in Saturn and the rest of the celestial cycles and give you a very detailed analysis of how, of how uh, to, to harvest leaf vegetables or fruits or when to sow, when not to, based on uh, planetary rhythms. And he also created uh, different preparations to be used in agriculture that we'll talk about in just a minute. Um, but he was... You know, he was asked uh, by one of his associates, uh, Dr. Ehrenhardt Pfeiffer, um, you know, you spend so much time stimulating these spiritual truths and, and wisdom and not many people take you up on it. I mean, why is that? This is in 1924. And his answer was, this is a problem with nutrition. Nutrition as it is today does not supply the strength necessary for manifesting the spirit in physical life. A bridge can no longer be built from thinking to will and action. Food plants no longer contain the forces people need to, for this. Um, for me, this is uh, everything. Uh, it, it, when I, I still get the chills when I, when I have regurgitate this thought because I, I can remember the first time that I read this and it hit me like a ton of bricks. It, it started to explain why we can all individually look around and understand the limitations of the world that we live in and, not, and feel like we can't do anything about it um, collectively. And you know, I, I've seen food change people. I mentioned we grew wheatgrass commercially for about a decade, and uh, I, I worked with people that cured their own uh, cancer, uh, many different illnesses from our wheatgrass, um, and just changed people's constitution from kind of on their back heels to leaning forward. Um, and it's a matter of nutrition. You know, we're all malnourished on, in some respect. I, I think the USDA data, uh, an apple from 1950, has the same iron in it as 26 apples today. So it's not, it's not a judgment at all. It's just the reality of our food system is not supplying the nourishment. And not only that, but name something in your daily diet that's potent of any consistency that's alive within 15 minutes from a root. Uh, and very few people can, can say that they have that source of, of life force in their diet. It's one of the things that makes wheatgrass so amazing is that you juice it from the root and you drink it, the juice, uh, almost immediately. So that's not a quantifiable thing. You can't stick a meter in wheatgrass juice and measure the life force of it. Uh, yet it's, it's absolutely therapeutic. Um, so, you know, that's, that's um, kind of brings me to the, the concept of, you know, beyond organic. Um, you know, we need something more than what the organic standard is offering us. Not, uh, again, organics is a good step in the right direction. Um, so how do we get there? You know, and, and a lot of it in my, in my thinking starts with our thinking. Um, on our perspective. So, you know, progressive regenerative agronomy is defined by diversity and balance. This is uh, 
you know, somewhat of a cliche, uh, I suppose. Um, but if you look at the diversity of the minerals being applied to a conventional field, in some cases, it's as few as three and five elements. Um, doesn't take much to imagine a plant wants much more than that. So a lot of the issues that we deal with are simply from, from a lack of perspective towards this diversity and balance. And where we end up is, you know, truth through humor. Um, you know, is it, is it really makes sense to spray toxic chemicals on the food that we eat? Um, you know, I, again, I stop short of judgment. You got to do what you got to do. But if you're taking the pill to eat more fast food, you know, how is that really making sense? Um, and we can think our way out of it, you know. Uh, and the reality is, you know, food is no longer our medicine, uh, as I was talking about a, a minute ago. Um, so, you know, coming to terms with this is, can allow us to do something about it. Um, so what, where I came to in these thoughts was, again, what I call bioenergetic agriculture. Um, you know, what I saw was that, um, you know, conventional agriculture was physical and it's mineral, um, organics brings in the biological, but both completely discount the concept of life force. Um, and biodynamics does a really good job of treading in, in the super sensible and the, 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 the life force realm, but it doesn't talk about microbial diversity and base saturation, mineral balance and cover crops and things that are entirely relevant to successful uh, regenerative farming. So uh, I don't necessarily remember where I was when I came to this term, but it, it does fit, um, you know, what I try to get across in the information uh, that I've been blessed with um, over the last 10, 15 years. Um, and this is the structure of it. You, know, you got the phys uh, bioenergetic agriculture. It's like four legs in a chair. You have a physical, mineral, biological, and energetic component to a living system. If you don't have one of them or we're not aware of them, we work against them um, and we don't leverage them to our benefit. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, each of these components just to kind of flesh out some of the concepts. And then over the weeks, we'll, we'll take time drilling down on each of these components uh, in their respective capacity so that we can you know, really get a good grip on how, not only how a living system works, but what we can do to make it work better. Um, Cause that's, that's really what we're talking about here. Agriculture is a manipulative uh, undertaking. Um, so the least that we can do to get in the way of the living system, the more it's working for us, the better the bottom line, the better result. This is not just an exercise in like a mother earth news crowd. Let's heal the earth. I mean, I'm all about that. Don't get me wrong, but it's got to work and it's got to be cost effective. Uh, and the really, great thing about these kinds of concepts is that they absolutely are they work so much better and they do cost so much less um so um you know that's a true win-win-win so the you know the physical component of soil is somewhat obvious um most people that deal with agronomy in some capacity um well all people let's say know what soil is uh it's an articulation of the plant itself its physiology um and, and the metabolic activity of plants it's a good good thing to have a, a pretty good grasp of how that works uh you could be talking about aerating plowing soil horizons uh structure you know on paper soil is organic matter clay and sand now we all know that soil is, is much more than that uh, the spirit of soil is, is is more than the sum of its parts not unlike a human being or, or a plant for that matter um, so, you know, the, the physical component, um, you know, we talk about the, the metabolism of a plant, uh, cell structure and, and contents, uh, plant, again, plant physiology, things like that. Um, but it's pretty self, self-explanatory in, in that regard. Um, the mineral component is, is one that, you know, we're all aware of, you know, we all know what a fertilizer is. Um, fertilizer is a crutch. Let's, let's state that up front. You know, there's a, a forest can, can grow trees with absolutely no fertilizer. Um, and that has to do with the maturity of the soil uh, and the maturity of the soil food web and the microbes involved in the soil. Um, but, you know, and, and that's not to say that the crutch is not needed, right? I mean, you can't, if soil is very mature and you cut it off cold turkey and say, soil, you got to take care of yourself right now, you're not going to have very good results. Um, but what's come of the mineral component with conventional agriculture over the last hundred years is, you know, let's fertilize, um, let's fertilize as little as possible with as few elements as possible. Um, and then we tend to chase our problems around. And, you know, like we've got done talking about in the first part, it shouldn't be surprising to us that plants are, are getting diseases and, 
you know, pests are not just bad luck. Um, they're doing exactly what they should be doing. So if, if our understanding is that we have bad luck, then the inclination is to go kill the problem. And that's a vicious cycle um, that, again, we can think our way out of. So people go and they start to get some soil testing. Typically, people will go to the extension service, um, free service. Um, it's a bit like going to the doctor and getting prescribed a pill. Uh, and I know many extension agents. Again, this is not judgment. Um, it's just simply the reality that I've experienced. It's a very pH-driven approach. Um, there's really not any discussion in regards to base saturation balance, which are, is fairly well understood and documented. Um, so, you know, the, again, that's a little bit of the learning curve that I had is when I sought out the experts in terms of uh, agronomy, um, the answers that I was getting didn't really hit me in the place where I was learning and experiencing. And, and it really forced me to go outside of that box and develop a wherewithal uh, that hopefully we can kind of arm you with over time. Um, but, you know, I mean, think about it uh, from a perspective of trace elements, too. Uh, they are extremely understated in regards to their importance in living systems. Um, so, you know, there's miracle growth um, is, has few elements. The next slide will show you. Uh, but why would Mother Nature make an element not needed in the garden? Uh, it's a rhetorical question. She wouldn't. And the idea that we ne need to have an understanding of what each element does in order to use it. Is, is a lot of the issues that we deal with in modern agronomy. Um, the, again, the further we look, the less we know, the more we got to figure out. So, you know, that idea of using naturally balanced materials, uh, focusing on trace elements along with the macro and the micronutrients uh, raises all ships and gives you uncalculable benefit towards the quality of what you're producing. Um, and then that's played forward to the people and also to the animals that we might be raising. You know, in very real terms, if it's not in the soil, it's not in the plant. If it's not in the plant, it's not in the people, right? Um, so this is a somewhat of a mantra that, you, that you'll hear uh, over time. So, you know, take a look at this. This is actually a, a slide of a product earth tonic that we make, and it's a sea mineral catalyst uh, fertilizer. Most people think that ocean water is bad for plants, and concentrationally it is, just like any fertilizer would be if you didn't dilute it. Uh, but it turns out it's a perfect fertilizer. It's got a very low NPK relatively, so it's not going to drive the production of a plant as a crutch, uh, as a standalone. It's a better supplement. Um, but if you look at, um, you know, I, I didn't include the images of the pictures, but basically this one's earth tonic on the left. Second from the left is a hydroponic nutrient where, you know, all of these elements down to cobalt have to be brought into the water or the plant can't form. It, they're called the essential elements, right? Um, so if you notice, this is miracle Grow, and I believe this is a, another budget fertilizer like Schultz or something like that. But if you see, they're missing half of what the plant has to have to grow. So it's fast food for plants, nothing more. It doesn't kill anything directly. But over time, we experience degeneration based on the fact that we're only adding half back of what the plant's using as a primary source of, of nutrition, not to mention what the plant wants, which is a completely different conversation. Um, so, you know, we make movies out of that, right? You, you watch Fast Food Nation or Super Size Me, and there's a pretty firm understanding of, you know, base nutrition um, for people that we know fast food doesn't deliver. And it's the same thing uh, in regards to, to fertilizers. Uh, there's a book called Sea Energy Agriculture. I'll, I'll introduce a bunch of books to you over time. Um, but this one was, uh, uh, Maynard Murray did some research back in the 70s supplementing high base hydroponic fertilizers with sea minerals and got some pretty remarkable results. Um, so we tend to focus on, you know, the number of elements present if we, we talk about fertilizer critically. Uh, but we, we fail to discount the, the complexity of nature and the concept of an isotope, for example, the fact that a singular element can express itself in different forms. You're not going to get that from a conventional fertilizer. It's almost a pharmaceutical grade of a very particularly elemental posture. Um, so, you know, we, we miss some of the potential there. Um, and, it, you know, it's not only that, you could also talk about how the elements and the ratios are uh, with each other. You know, um, boron and calcium is a popular one. You know, boron needs to be one one thousandth of calcium in your soil in order for plants to utilize calcium arguably the most important element for plant growth. So you can have all the calcium in the world present, but if you've got an extreme boron deficiency, uh, well, then the system is limited and it can actually manifest as, uh, as a, uh, a mineral deficiency. Uh, that's known as the law of the minimum. You know, when essential nutrition, if one element is deficient, doesn't matter how perfect the rest of them are. So in common sense terms, if we're not looking for all of those elements, essentially, 
Uh, you know, how do we know what to add? How do we know what not to add? How do we seek the balance that we look for if we're not looking at it from that perspective? So I wanted to give you a quick example of that. Uh, this is a soil test that we generated locally. Uh, I think this was from a while back, but it gets the point across uh, in a good way. Around me, we have acidic soil. So you can see it's at a five and a half. Uh, the pH of, of anything, uh, but of soil also, is, de is determined by the exchangeable hydrogen. It's an algorithm of hydrogen ion presence. The more hydrogen present, the more acidic. Basically what, it's, what it means is the soil is empty when it's acidic. So if you're familiar with the concept of adding lime to increase the pH, what's technically happening is lime is calcium, sometimes magnesium if it's dolomitic, but for the sake of discussion, it's calcium. So when you add that lime and that calcium, the positively charged calcium is a stronger bond than the hydrogen. So it kicks the hydrogen off at the exchange capacity and replaces it with calcium. Therefore, the pH number goes up. So in this situation, if you took it to an extension service, we're right at the 60% we want on our base saturation for calcium. So if we took this to the extension with that pH, it's a fair bet that they would recommend lime to increase that number um, because it's an equation, right? It's like taking a pill. You got a symptom, well, here's the pill. It might mean you need to take another one and on and on you go. But the point being, in this scenario, we've got enough calcium. What we're deficient in is magnesium, potassium, sodium, boron, iron, manganese, basically everything else, right? Um, so you can correct that number with, with lime. It's this amount of, of lime per acre. Bam, you hit your mark. But you're adding more of what you've already got enough of, and you're not addressing the deficiency. And that, in a nutshell, I mean, you can get a lot more technical than that, um, is a, a perfect example of how we're missing the mark. Um, so our soil testing process is run this data through a spreadsheet of what it should be. It kicks out an elemental deficiency and we write a prescription based on what's missing um, to regenerate the balance in the soil. And the, the cool irony is that when you get this balance within range, it's never, a C, it's never gonna be perfect, but within a general range, the pH is always where you want it to be, around a six and a half, slightly acidic, uh, crop dependent. Um, so the, the effort is to balance the soil, not change the number in the pH. That's just a number on a piece of paper. It's kind of the afterthought, if you will. Um, so, you know, talking about exchange capacity, how that works, we'll cover that in detail. Um, all of these concepts you could make a, a, a presentation out of on their own in some capacity. Uh, so again, today we're just kind of running through some ideas. Um, you know, hydroponics is something I have a, a high level experience with commercially and just uh, hobby based. Um, it's a it's a great form of growth. It's very simple. Um, it can I would argue that it's probably a superior method of growth to what we have available to us conventionally in the grocery store. Um, you know, maybe mostly because it can be done more locally, and I think that that that's something that's not really tread upon as a value in food is how old it is and how how long it's since it's been harvested. Um, but this is, image really says it all for hydroponics. It's really a method of paying closer attention to what crop you're growing. And then calibrating the fertilizer solution that you're delivering to that crop to uh, the crop specificity. And in some cases, even a strain specificity. Uh, you know, a head of lettuce might want six, 800 parts per million of a fertilizer, uh, whereas a tomato might want 1,500 to 3,500. So that's a really wide range from 600 to 3,500. So if you're feeding both plants in the same system, the same fertilizer, it would have to be on the lettuce end of the fertilization to not burn it. And you're significantly hindering what the tomato is able to produce. So in hydroponics, you articulate that, you separate the reservoirs and, and the fertilizer solutions, and therefore the plant grows up instead of down. Uh, in a way of saying it, you know, a plant doesn't really wanna grow roots, it has to, right? And it's based somewhat on surface area. So if the fertilizer solution is low, the plant's got to work harder in its root system to expose itself to the level of fertility that it needs to drive its metabolism. Um, and so you do see significant yielding increases in hydroponics. The, the one place that can be missed is that typically hydroponics are only what the plant has to have. It's that essential nutrient, uh, essential element conversation, which is better than something like miracle Grow or you know, an NPK-based uh, agronomic approach but it's still not treading in the realm of trace elements, um, which is kind of what Maynard Murray was hitting on. So, you know, what, what we do um, is, is try to marry those. Um, so, you know, this is a statement that's true. You know, uh, hydroponics grows the plant, soil, uh, you know, organics and bioenergetic uh, approaches grow the ecosystem. Um, 
grow the soil, if you will. So the majority of issues that we deal with in, in conventional agriculture are born of treating the soil like a hydroponic system. Um, you know, organic is about feeding microbes um, in its essence, but the microbes have to be there to be fed. We'll talk about them in just a sec. Uh, but this is an example of marrying the, the scenario. We added a cup per gallon of compost tea to the, these are cloned jalapeno plants. Uh, I had a guy that did a senior thesis on this um, in college when we had progressive gardens. And so you can see everything's identical um, from the genetic standpoint, from the system standpoint. The only difference was compost tea was added every two weeks in the reservoir changes um, in the one on the right. And you can see the development of the root system. He also generated data on the fruit development and it was quite significant. Um, so, you know, these things with some forethought and some, some insight into how these systems work, we can marry a lot of these concepts in ways that we might not have thought about before. Um, so another way to think about this from a mineral perspective is, is the concept of weeds. You know, never would I ever say that, you know, balancing your exchange capacity is going to work like an herbicide. Um, it's, it's never going to be a, a black and white scenario, but literally the only mechanisms soil have to mature themselves are microbes and annual weeds. So the annual weed grows aggressively and seasonally, and then it dies to deliver what it fixed to the topsoil. They're medicinal herbs for the soil, just like for people. I mean, dandelion's a perfect example. My mom drinks the dandelion tea every day for calcium. The taproot of a dandelion goes way down into the subsoil. Uh, if you ever tried to pull one up, you can't get to the bottom of it. So what it's doing is aggressively developing this root system, pulling calcium up into the topsoil that's available in that subsoil. And then it dies seasonally to regenerate the calcium in the soil. And what you'll notice if you pay attention, because I have in my area, we don't have dandelions that grow here. We tend, I just showed you a minute ago, a soil test. We tend to have higher calcium in the soil to begin with. What we're deficient is all the other elements. So when I, whenever I present this to somebody who moves into our town, and there's a lot of, we're a coastal community, a lot of people moving into this town, like going to double the population by 19, uh, 2040, I think. It's kind of insane. Um, but what they notice is where they come from, they might have dandelions growing everywhere. And, you know, we didn't do any soil testing, so it can't connect it. But I'm from Greensboro, three hours up the road, clay soil type in the Piedmont of North Carolina. We're in the coastal uh, plains where you got a beach, basically. Um, so we had dandelions growing everywhere where I'm from and not down here. And, you know, anecdotally and over time, measurably, I've noticed that the, the reason for that is the association of calcium to, to the dandelion. And you've blown a dandelion seed before. We don't live in a bubble. Weed seeds stay dormant for up to 50 years in the soil. So the exercise is not to try to kill the weed because we imagine that it's contamination and not to wait on the weeds because arguably we don't have the time period of which to allow them to regenerate that soil but to, to evaluate them differently, take some soil sampling, balance the soil. And what we notice is we strengthen the ability in like in a pasture environment for the turf to grow. It's a perennial plant uh, and discourage the need for the annual weed to mature the soil. Almost sounds too simple, but it, it's literally the way that it works. Um, so again, you know, there's almost a whole presentation uh, born in that idea. Um, so, you know, let's talk about the biological component of bioenergetic agriculture. You know, my, microbes make soil, period. Uh, humans don't make soil. We can put all of the ingredients together, but, you know, try drinking a beer without yeast. It's not a beer, right? Uh, or bread or kombucha or kimchi or cheese or any number of different things like that. Um, the microbes define the process. They're, they're alchemists in that regard. And we can't replace them. Um, we can work to mitigate them. Um, but you know, once we kind of come into terms with the importance, the effort is to how to how to grow the balance. Um, so, you know, think about it like the ocean. You know, the, what if you took the plankton out of the ocean? That's a lot of what people are dealing with uh, in terms of tired, dead soil. Um, and so the big fish eats the little fish, right? You get the plankton right, then you got the shrimp, then you got the mackerel, then you got the tuna, then you got the shark, and you don't have the apex predator unless everything underneath it is healthy, right? Um, and so that lack of an apex predator and immature soil, that's what results in uh, parasitic nematodes, uh, chinch bug, mole cricket, ground pearl, fleas, fire ants, all sorts of different issues, grubs that bring moles, on and on and on. They're all born of biological deficiency, of microbial deficiency, of lacking that plankton. So this is an image of the food web. And you can see you've got your organic matter up top, uh, your primary consumers and decomposers, the fungi and the bacteria. They're eaten by nematodes and protozoa and some of the microarthropods, uh, mites and springtails. And then you've got the things we can see, 
the earthworms that bring the birds and, and so on. Um, so the focus on the smallest strengthens the whole system and you build from the bottom up. Um, and you know, you've probably heard the term symbiotic relationship before. This is an image of a lichen. It's actually a marriage of two different organisms. It's a quintessential example of symbiotic relationships. That's really how nature works. It's a give and a take, right? Parasitic is a one way street where the, something is taking from the host. Where symbiotic is each are providing benefits. So in a lichen, an algae is photosynthesizing for photosynthates and the fungi is solubilizing the fertility needed to drive the photosynthetic activity. Uh, and they've married each other. Uh, and that's really how soil was born, on rocks, solubilizing these elements, microbes eating themselves, and plants feeding the soil to reciprocate the activity of the microbes. That's how humus is, is created um, in, a, in a living system. So there's all sorts of residual benefits. This is a pretty famous microscopic image of a, a parasitic nematode being captured by a beneficial fungi. Um, we deal with a lot of parasitic nematodes around me. We've got a lot of flower farms, and the, the approach is typically to try to fumigate the soil and kill the nematode. Um, sad irony of nematodes is that if you say that to a farmer, nine out of ten are going to, ah, I hate those things. And the assumption is that nematodes are bad. Maybe one percent of nematode species are parasitic, are, are negative to plant growth, and they happen to be the only ones we pay attention to because we, we don't experience the benefits of the other ones. Um, so this is just an example of, of some of the residual benefit that you get out of creating biological balance in your soil. Um, you know, I mentioned it earlier, but it's, it's good to highlight, you know, organic gardening is about feeding soil microbes. So, you know, they really need to be there to be fed. And, you know, that's where composting comes from. Uh, turns out a lot of compost is not humus. Um, compost is an easy word to sell. I've done the biological testing on the largest compost distributor in the United States. That's in Kentucky. It's a horse track uh, distribution network. And they, uh, you know, there's urea and uh, parasitic nematodes and very little soil microbe activity in this uh, compost product at all. It's basically aged manure is what it is. So that the nitrogen that makes it hot off gases, um, but the organic matter can't just melt. It, you you got to add the soil microbes, you got to add the yeast to make the bread, right? Um, so, you know, this is a, a lot of the root of the issue of the results people get in home gardens. They go buy the word compost from a big box store, from a bulk distributor locally. And around me, it's all pine bark and turkey manure. And I've done the biological testing on it and there's no soil microbes in it. And so it's got some residual fertilizer in it from the manure and from the urea, uh, the animal waste. Um, but once that's exhausted, things fall apart. So what happens is people tend to get a pretty decent result first season in a raised bed, for example. And then next season, they start experiencing all sorts of issues. And they don't necessarily associate it to the beginning of what they did and not adding the microbes because it's been a whole season, right? Um, but I can't tell you how many times that would happen. Um, almost every day in the spring when we get new customers, they would just say, you know, they describe that exact experience. And I'd say, yeah, let me guess, you bought, you know, some what you thought was compost last year and you got a pretty good result. Now things are falling apart. Hey, how'd you know? Um, it's, it's, it happens over and over and over. So, you know, it's not that you don't want to go buy those things. They may be the best value you can find for your dollar. Nothing wrong with that. But with this knowledge of how to grow your own microbes uh, and compost properly and apply those to this material, you can make good humus out of just about anything. That's what composting is. Um, you know, compost pile is the, the gut of the landscape. And, you know, I think the future of, of medicine is going to be, you know, the gut brain barrier. And, and uh, it's not just my idea. Just do some web searches on the importance of gut microbes to health. And it's, it's pretty, pretty unbelievable um, how important they are. It's, it's same for the soil. Um, you know, aquaponics is a really good example of that. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that either do this or are familiar. But it's leveraged on microbes cycling fish waste into plant food. Um, nothing new there. That's how nature works, right? The leaves that fall in a forest, the trees don't eat the leaves. They eat what the microbes in the soil make out of it. That is composting. We just give it a name and put it in the space and pay more attention to it. Maybe speed it up a little bit. We can also mess it up quite considerably. Um, but it's always amazing when I'm working with commercial aquaponics growers, why there's not more mindset around proactively adding the microbes that do the cycling. Typically what happens is you just wait for them to get up to, to cycling population. And, you know, inevitably that will happen. We don't live in a sanitized world, but, you know, start thinking critically about the diversity of the bacterial species doing that work. 
not only does it cut down the cycling time to start the system, but it strengthens the health of the system. There's all sorts of residual benefits that you get from this kind of thing, you know, like irrigation in a pasture or, or any kind of a farming environment. This is the same soil in both scenarios, pack on mescaline greens on the flat, and then I would water them to maturity. This is images after not watering for four days. So the left side got compost tea, the right didn't. Uh, so after four days, the one that didn't get the microbes completely desiccated. I could make a salad out of the other one. Um, you know, I've had this result with many a people. A lot of the conventional farmers that approach us from for our compost tea brewers and supplies are doing it from for water considerations. It's their biggest line item. Um, so if they can save 25% on their water bill every year, they're very, 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 very happy. Uh, and that's absolutely doable. So, you know, we'll talk about composting, you know, methods, how to, you know, think about the carbon to nitrogen ratio, how to get the, you know, what to add, what not to add, things like that. Um, we'll talk about compost tea. Uh, it's, it's simply a concentration of compost, essentially, in the same way that compost is a concentration of soil. It's not unlike an aquarium. You're aerating the water for the microbes to breathe and you feed them organic fertilizers. And in the presence of food and oxygen, the microbes grow to extraordinary concentrations. Um, so it's something that you can do in a commercial unit for a thousand acre farm, or you could do it in a five gallon bucket uh, for your home garden. Um, so we'll, we'll learn about that. And, you know, here's, uh, this is a beneficial nematode that's caught on something and a protozoa uh, that's nutrient cycling there. They, they're eating bacteria and fungi primarily. And another little guy down in the corner. This, these come from our compost tea recipe. Um, so, you know, we'll have a, a healthy look at soil microbes and, and learn their functioning and, analogy that really works for me is, you know, uh, and I find works for other people is microbes are construction workers, right? And so the more often you bring them to the job site, the more you bring it one time, the faster they build the neighborhood. You can't build a neighborhood in a day. So a single application, unless it's in a composting environment where everything is uber potential, in a poor soil environment, it really the consistency of use is, is so important. Um, so the, the construction workers are important. That's typically what's missing in a lot of organic applications. They're just using organic fertilizers and dead soil and they're getting a better result. They're also paying more for it. Um, but you're not instilling the engine of the soil to do that for you. That only comes through inoculation of soil microbes. And then think about the trace elements as the toolkit, something that's really not tread upon um, in many agricultural circles, but uh, every element on the periodic table that's earthbound has an enzyme potential. So if you don't have all the elements there, it's like hiring microbes to build a house and giving them half the tools. They just can't express themselves completely. And that inability to do so manifests in diseases and pest infestations and uh, et cetera. So, you know, in that analogy, the healthy soil is the neighborhood. Once you've built the neighborhood and the personalities have moved in, it takes on a life of its own uh, and, and all sorts of really great things happen. You know, not unlike a forest. Again, consider this tree and the whole forest around it grows without any human influence whatsoever. Um, not to say we're trying to make your, your landscape or your farm a forest, but the, the concept of soil maturity and the type of growth that can be accomplished uh, in soil conditions is, is generally not even close to realized in the soil on, uh, on farms these days. It also makes a, a lot of sense for people that are, you know, into permaculture and, and, and you know, doing a food forest or, or some kind of homestead. Um, you know, a lot of people buy property that's been farmed and is tired and looking to regenerate it. And the best way to do that is microbes. This is a, a perfect example. Bi-weekly compost tea applications, about a gallon per 500 square feet of our recipe. And you can actually see, this is a local ball field, a business partner at the time, his son went to Laney. Uh, high school in town, and you can, uh, New Hanover, uh, actually, not that it really matters to you, but um, you can see the soil that we, we grew. You can see the, the, the earth that, that was generated through the exudates being fed to the soil by the plant and the re reciprocity of the microbes um, and them ripping themselves to shreds. And basically, humus is the guts of microbes in a way of looking at it. Uh, this, this woman won the worst lawn in Wilmington contest that we had when, in our lawn care days. And this is uh, eight months, as was the last one, I believe it was nine months. So this was after one full season of compost tea applications. And I, and I believe on this one, we did the soil testing. On the other one, we didn't. Um, but, you know, regeneration is definitely possible regardless of the scenario. Uh, so, you know, disease is an organism eating your plant that has nothing to eat it. Rather than try to kill the disease with something that kills everything, we can balance the problem out. Um, again, simple, but that's a good thing. Uh, it's, we overcomplicate a lot of this stuff. 
So the energetic capacity, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about water and we'll be through here, um, is the part where you can kind of maybe lose some people, you know, life force. It sounds like witchcraft, woo woo, that kind of thing. And I can relate. I didn't believe half of the book Secrets of the Soil when I first read it, if I'm honest. Um, but I've spent the last 15 years documenting it for myself and having experiences that, that proved otherwise. And so I'm challenging everybody out there to have those same sort of experiences, you know, wipe the slate clean. Uh, let's not bring any baggage to, to our ability to, to have faith in these living systems. And let's, let's learn a little bit about it. Um, you know, the cation exchange capacity of the soil, you know, clay and organic matter are negatively charged and they hold positive elements. Opposites attract. That right there is energy. Um, a thought is energy. You know, life is energetic. Um, the earth is the aurora borealis. Uh, the earth is a living organism. It breathes in the season. It breathes in in the winter and it breathes out in the summer. So biodynamic agriculture leverages that reality uh, to potentize the materials that they're using in, in order to uh, apply them to the field. Uh, so it's, it's homeopathic farming, if you will. And I, I wouldn't want to paint the picture that you can go spray energies on your field and fix everything, which is why I don't use the term biodynamic, incidentally, and, and why I chose bioenergetic, because there's uh, it, it's not a biodynamics is not a complete farming system. Um, that was my experience. And, and, you know, when I first was excited and started telling people about it and I led with, look, we bury cow horns and spray energies. People are like, <laughs> it's later, you know, they, they, they couldn't connect to it and I can't blame them. Um, but there's very real people in, in our history, you know, Nikola Tesla, Victor Schauberger, Wilhelm Reich, uh, Dr. Uh, Pfeiffer, uh, Rudolf Steiner, um, that brought a lot of amazing information forward and, and our efforts are to always continue to learn and add. Uh, so it's kind of a living process, but bioenergetics is simply a platform to, to talk about this stuff. Um, so we'll get into biodynamics in detail uh, in the future. Um, but I want to ask you a question, you know, why does a plant grow up? Uh, if, if you heard of the, so by the moon, you know, the idea that the full moon encourages plant growth, the answer you probably would give is it's the extra gravity from the moon pulling it up. Right. Well, the moon doesn't win in a tug of war of gravity with the earth. Um, and there's a way of articulating that Schauberger was known to say, you know, we spend so much time thinking about how Newton got hit in the head by an apple and he pondered gravity. Everybody remembers that fable from school, right? But how much time did we talk about how the apple got up there to begin with? And it's kind of an interesting thought. Uh, we, we don't in any direct way. There's just an assumption that the plant grows. Um, but again, so being critical about these things can draw out all sorts of really fascinating concepts, but things that we can start to leverage uh, to a living system. Um, so there's more going on than meets the eye. You know, pests are a good ex uh, explanation of that. You see this is an electron microscope of a white fly antenna. And there's a uh, Dr. Phil Callahan spent his career documenting these things that pests are attracted to unhealthy plants. You force feed plants nitrogen and it can't that metabolize the, all the amino acids it's forced, forced to create. And those empty proteins are, plant, are pest food, literally. And they vibrate in frequencies that attract pests in the formaldehyde and, and ammonia range. So that these pests see the food. It's not just like they flew by our neighborhoods and having to land on our plants. Um, so again, you know, our mindset can really change these sort of things considerably. Uh, so I wanted to kind of end here and just referencing water uh, because I, I think it's really underreported uh, the importance of water. It's the blood of the earth and all water is not the same and it's never H2O. It's uh, the most anomalous substance in the world. Um, it's probably the, the most obvious and simple substance and the most misunderstood and, and important at the same time. Um, so, you know, we don't have the time to really drill down on some of these concepts today, but you know, this is the back of a wave. You see those hydraulics happening. This is uh, the image of uh, in, in the micro maker systems that we uh, compost tea brewers. They create recirculation using air as an airless system that has a drain in it. So, you know, I like to say we don't make a vortex. We allow it. Uh, this is what water does when it's allowed to. It's why a river meanders or a raindrop spirals or a wave curls. Um, so how often do we collectively consider what water wants? It's kind of strange to give it a personality. I understand. Um, that's why I use activated water instead of living water or structured water. People ask me what the structure is, and I can't tell you. Nobody's ever really seen water molecules. Um, and the same with living water. It's not alive. Well, you're right, you know, um, limitation of language. So, you know, activated water is, is simply the idea of being able to get more out of the water in terms of cellular hydration. 
Uh, there's a lot of science behind this discovery of Nobel Prize in chemistry in 2003, I believe it was, is, uh, discovery of the aquaporin. It's a protein channel in a cell. Cells drink water one molecule at a time. In a very oversimplified way of stating it, if the surface tension of water is clustered too tightly, the cell can't access the water. So we can drink half our weight in water ounces a day, which we're told to do not to be dehydrated, and still be medically dehydrated because the water is just irrigating our kidneys. It's not hydrating our cells, right? It's not delivering nutrition and oxygen and taking away toxins. So from a plant perspective, that means we need to use more fertilizer to get a, the, the result that we want. Whereas when we have activated water and it's able to diffuse into life uh, more directly, uh, we can get a better result using a lot less. Um, so, you know, there's a great book, The Fourth Phase of Water, that goes into a lot of the water's history. It's the worst control uh, on Earth. It's a universal solvent. So any test or, or uh, study that does that documents some anomaly in water uh, inevitably is thrown out before it's published because I didn't know this until I read this book. But Nature Publication, for example, will send out a team to your lab to replicate your experiment, which totally makes sense. Um, but once they you know, they start with pure water and by the end, water's picked up some silica from the test tube and that silica is a contaminant. So all the research gets sh thrown out. So, and this happened to the, the Russians in the 50s and the French in the 70s and Pollock goes through a lot of this history and he's kind of the, the champion in, in the United States these days, but he, he discovered what he calls the fourth phase of water. It's a hybrid between a, a, the solid and a, a, a liquid phase and it's kind of a crystalline structure in water and it explains why clouds are held together and how water works in inside of cells and why juicing plants to, to drink is so healthy um, so it, again it gives you a window into a lot of these these things that may seemingly not be well understood um, so we'll spend a, a lot of time talking about water as well because it's kind of the atmosphere that all of this works in, uh, right? I mean, we're, what, 90% water, uh, same with plants. Uh, so really important to consider. Um, so this is kind of a good culmination statement, healthy balance and diverse perspective is the most powerful gardening product. I believe that wholeheartedly. Uh, hopefully you've gotten a little bit out of what we talked about today. And, uh, you know, again, this was simply just an introduction to myself and a little bit of what we'll talk about over time. And if there are any questions, I uh, would love to take them, um, and I appreciate your time today.